Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, Cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the oaths you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? 
And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just going to say a brief prayer before we hear the sermon. Lord God, build your kingdom here. May we be changed into your people so that you can build your kingdom here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> last week, uh, as many of you know, we began a sermon series looking at the Sermon on the Mount called Being Salt and Light. Looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and we need to think of the Sermon on the Mount not just as sort of good advice, though it is good aspirational advice, we need to understand it in the context of who Jesus was and what he did, and in the context of what Matthew, the gospel writer, is trying to tell us about Jesus. Let's just draw back from the Sermon on the Mount and look at its context for a minute. In chapter 2 of Matthew's gospel, Jesus had been to Egypt, escaped there with his parents. He had then been through water in his baptism by John and in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. And now he's arrived in the land of promise. He is announcing God's kingdom is at hand. He announces that in chapter 4, verse 17 of Matthew's Gospel. And it's no accident that all of those things are recorded in the order that they are. Because what Matthew is saying is that God is doing something new among his people. Moses went into Egypt and brought his people out of Egypt. The Ten Commandments begin with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you were slaves. Have no other gods but me. God's original covenant with his people Israel. They went from Egypt, through the water, into the wilderness, and into the promised land. And Moses spoke to them God's law on a mountainside. Jesus went through from Egypt, through the water, into the wilderness, and is speaking to God's people from the mountainside. That's no accident. What Matthew's saying is God is doing something new here. God did something saving his people Israel. God's doing something new here now, saving his people. And so we don't see the Sermon on the Mount just in isolation. We see it as part of God's new covenant, as part of God's new intervention in the world in the form of Jesus, claiming the world back from himself. Jesus is absolutely deliberately echoing what happened in the Old Testament when Moses came down with the, Old, with the Ten Commandments. We'll see later in this, as Jenny read to us, you were told in the olden days, but I say, Exactly the same. That was then, but this is now. God did something then. He's doing something different now. And so we have that little bit of context, and we now see Jesus sitting there on the mountainside, talking to his disciples, and beyond his disciples, the other many followers of Jesus, the 12 disciples and the others around the side, as Jesus is setting out the new covenant that God has with his people. And in verse 13 to 16, and if you have a look at page 969, that's where we'll find all this. In verses 13 to 16, which Rebecca talked about last week, he says to his followers, you should be salt and light. That's what God wants for you to be, salt and light and a city stood on a hill that can't be hidden, hidden. That's what Israel was called to be. But 
failed. But he's saying, God's renewing things now. This is what you are called to be. You are called to be those that make the world a better place, to be salt and light in God's world. You're called to be a city that stood on a hill. But that begs the question, what does it mean to be salt and light? How do we go about being salt and light? And this passage that Jenny has just read for us is just that. How do we be salt and light? How do we live as God's people? And Jesus says five times, five different things. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you, in the olden days, this is what God required of his people Israel. But I tell you, in this new era that I am inaugurating, this is what God requires. And he says these five things. Now, as Peter said earlier, he could have gone for a long time. There's an awful lot of material here. I'm going to skim over it. I'm also not going to say, come and I'll give you the rest of it afterwards, because we've all got homes to go to, um, and we need to warm up. So, but I'm going to go quickly through these, because they are absolute dynamite, these five things. And all of them have that common thread. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. You've heard that it was said, do not murder. But I tell you, don't get angry. You've heard it was said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, even if you look lustfully at a woman, you've done it in your heart. You've said, honour your oaths. But I say, don't use words to manipulate people. You've heard it was said, don't take revenge, but I say, be generous in your spirit, even to those who are bad to you. You have said, heard it was said, love your friends and hate your enemies, but I say, love your enemies. What Jesus is saying is the law gave a way of limiting the damage of human society. But what God wants is transformed hearts. Because behind murder, is anger, is treating people as nothing, as treating people as dispensable, as treating people whom you can just dismiss because they're not worth it. And Jesus says, no. That person that you want to dismiss is God's child, just like you are. You have no right, not only not to murder them, you have no right just to dismiss them as worthless, to say, you fool. No. They're God's child, just like you. Adultery was forbidden. But Jesus says it begins not with the act. It begins with treating people as there for your pleasure. Not seeing them as persons, but seeing them as things that you can use and throw away as you want. And that's not just about sex. It's about treating people as commodities. It's about treating people for what they can do for you, not seeing them as rich human beings made in the image of God. Lust and objectification and just treating people as things, they are the starting point of adultery. Using words to manipulate. Originally it was said, only make an oath on God, as God is my witness. What Jesus is saying, no. When you do that, you're not allowing people to make their mind up. You're claiming God's authority on what you say. No. If your words are good enough, let your words be your words. Don't get the armies of heaven behind you so that a person is manipulated into doing what you want them to do. Respect them as God's creature like you are and let them decide rather than claiming that you are right because God is my witness. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
really was damage limitation. We see that in today's conflicts as, we had, as we've done throughout the centuries. But what Jesus says is no. Be generous in your spirit. Don't overcome evil by a stronger evil. Overcome evil with good. Love the person who is being tough with you. And if they force you to go a mile, go a second mile. And finally, love your enemies, Jesus says. It's easy to love your friends, but those people who don't like you. God makes his sun shine on them as he makes his sun shine on you. So be like God and learn to love them. He summarises it all in verse 48. He says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I wonder how Jesus' disciples sitting in front of him responded to that. I wonder how you and I respond to that. It's movie quote time. I can't do this. I just can't do this. I've never murdered anyone, but I've been angry. I've never committed adultery. But I have lusted. I have objectified people. I've used them because it was convenient to me. I've used words and unfairly twisted people's arms by my words. I've thought venomous thoughts about people who I know don't like me. All of those things that Jesus says are at the heart of the things that go wrong. I've done them all. So when he says, I can't do this, when he says, do this, I say, I can't do this. It just feels impossible. I can try, but I know I just can't do this. So it's important that we remember that the Sermon on the Mount is not primarily advice it's part of the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's see what it means in that context. First of all, it points us to what Jesus can and did do. Because Jesus did live all of those points, those five points he was making. He did forgive. I would say, you know, if you want to get warm, go there, but I haven't quite finished yet. <laughs> I'd absolutely be with you. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, he lived that life. In particular, he loved his enemies. And that took him to his death on the cross when we were his enemies. He uniquely lived the life he preached in the Sermon on the Mount. He was the person who did all of those things. And as I said, it took him to his death. So when he said at the beginning of the reading that Jenny did for us, he hadn't come to abolish the law, he'd come to fulfil it. He did fulfil the law and the prophets. The prophets pointed to him and he was the one who carried the sin of the world on his shoulders that we laid on him so that we would not have to do it. And he taught a new way of being human. And that new way of being human was to offer forgiveness, as we see countless times in the Gospel. He offered forgiveness and wholeness of life to people who knew they needed it. To all those people who said, I can't do this. He offered forgiveness and a fresh start. So, what can we do? What can we do? Well, we can respond to his offer of forgiveness, just like his first followers did, like those people in Galilee did. For the times that we fail to live up 
to those five points he said were so important in the Sermon on the Mount. For the times when we fail to live that fully human life because we are full of revenge, because we're full of lust, because we're full of anger. We come to him and say, I can't do this. And he says, don't worry, I have done this and I forgive you. But that's not quite all because he does restore us, but he also changes us. Jesus promised at the end of his life, the resurrected Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. And he is with us and he does change us over time, day by day, minute by minute, lifetime by lifetime, he changes us. He changes us ultimately into the people for whom to be perfect isn't just a vain aspiration, it's a direction of travel. Part of being a Christian is being changed into the person that God wanted us to be, to be that fully human person that can forgive, that can value other people just as they are, that doesn't need to exert their self and their authority over others. Be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's the direction of travel, not a vain hope. Paul put it beautifully in his letter to the Philippians. He said this, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because we will try and we will fail and we will try again and we will fail again. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfil his good purpose. God is at work in us. We are being changed and one day we will be perfect in the presence of our Lord, worshipping him.